Send them out. Yep. If you want to sing along, go ahead. So. Two ten. just uh, trips me out. Kaylee's in college now. I know it. Driving. Oh. Dave will be 13 here before too long, and I'm just 40. <laughs> <laughs> I tell you what, the boys are growing up so much. I used to could just hold them down, you know, but not anymore. It's, 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 a, it's a handful now. But I praise the Lord. The oldest three, all three are saved. Amen. And uh, the next two have both professed Christ and will be being baptized here before too long. So I'll be missing a Sunday here before too long Amen. to go down and share in that service. And then that just leaves the two youngest. And uh, Lord willing, it won't be too long till they profess faith in Christ also. So I just, I thank the Lord. Acts chapter 19, verse 1 through 7. <clears throat> Mama, I hope you enjoyed that. So. <laughs> While Apollos was in Corinth, Paul traveled through the inner regions and came to Ephesus, and he found some disciples. And he asked them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? No, they told him, we haven't even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. Into what then were you baptized, he asked them. Into John's baptism, they replied. Well, Paul said, John baptized with the baptism of repentance, telling the people that they should believe in the one who would come after him, that is, in Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they began to speak in other tongues and to prophesy. Now there were about 12 men in all. Father, help us this morning as we study your word and Father, help us to see your truth and understand, Father, what you would have for us today as in faith in Jesus Christ. 
Lord, help us to see our need and touch our hearts this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Now, as I've suggested many, many times in, in preaching and teaching here, that when you read the four Gospels, that you should read them not so much as New Testament, but at the least as a transition period between the Old Testament and the New Testament. That's why you see so many things in the Gospels that apply to the law. And if you're sitting there reading them and you're reading them with a New Testament mentality, it's going to confuse you. Because we're sitting here saying, the Bible says if you'll just trust in Jesus Christ, you'll be saved. And it does say that. And I'm going to show you that here in a few minutes. But when you read the Gospels, there are so many times that Jesus says, okay, now that you have faith, do this. Go show yourself to the priest. Go offer the sacrifice. And that's because they are still under the Old Testament law. The New Testament doesn't actually begin until the book of Acts. Also, when you read the book of Acts, you should also see it as a transition period. Moving from the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ to the fullness of the New Testament church. Yes, the church began in Acts chapter 2 with the coming of the Holy Spirit, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, the apostles teaching and, and laying down the foundation. But all the way through the book of Acts, you're going to see different things. And you're going to see one time they did something this way. The next time they did it this way. And I'm going to show you several examples. And that brings us to the text that we read this morning. And when I read that, if you are very familiar with Scripture and the book of Acts in particular, you're going to say, well, that was kind of weird. So when you read the book of Acts, you need to understand that it also is a transitional period. One way to look at it is that things just haven't been nailed down yet. They're still growing. They're still learning. Remember that the new church was made up mostly of Jews. The Acts chapter 2 event where 3,000 people were saved in one day, probably most of those were Jews. And then it began to branch out. They began to preach the gospel all around in Samaria and Judea, reaching out to the uttermost parts of the world, as Scripture says, and, and Gentiles began to come into the church as the church began to grow. And one of the bigger problems that they had was the Jewish contingent of the church was still hung up in the law. They still wanted to do things the old way, the Old Testament way, and that was a big problem. Another problem that they had, it seems, in the early church where there were two messages about Jesus being preached. And we see that in our text. First of all, there was the message of John the Baptist, centered on his ministry, centered on what he had to say and what he preached about Jesus being the Messiah that has come and all should repent, be baptized, and follow him. And then, and from that message we see here in our text, these 12, you see back up in chapter 18, you see Apollos. And he was a great preacher, but all he knew was the baptism of John. He didn't know further about Jesus and his death and resurrection yet. And then the other message was the message that the apostles had been commissioned to preach. And that was the message of the risen Savior. That all people should repent and believe in Jesus as Lord and Savior and be baptized in the Holy Spirit. That was the second message. Now, if you go back to John, we're not going to do it right now, but go back to John chapter 3, sometime this afternoon or later on, and read, beginning in about verse 20 and on down, you'll see that John the Baptist was still preaching and baptizing even after Jesus had started his ministry. You'll find in that passage that it is Passover in Jerusalem, and Jesus is there, and he started his ministry but John the Baptist is still preaching and still baptizing people for the coming Messiah. And so you have kind of a, a mix of messages here. And you have people that are hearing John the Baptist, getting baptized, 
looking for the Messiah, realizing that Jesus is the Messiah, and then going back home. And through the time, they don't hear the rest of the message. They don't know that Jesus has died and risen again for our faith. We see that again in our text and in chapter 18 with a pause. You say, well, how can that be, Brother Don? Well, you think about the world back then. Even the known world was a big place. And when you realize that they didn't have TV, they didn't have cell phones, they didn't have the internet, they didn't have cars, if they had any type of news, it was very limited. So their world got a whole lot bigger than our world did. And you could come to the Passover in Jerusalem, in particular three years before Jesus' death and resurrection, hear the message of John, receive Jesus as the Messiah, be baptized and go back home and never hear anything else. In particular, where was Apollos from? Alexandria, Egypt. Now folks, that wasn't Let's just run over to Alexandria this afternoon. That was a trip of days, of months back in that time. And some of these people were going back, as you read the list in Acts chapter 2, to far away places. You got some cousins you ain't seen in years? So did they. They had family scattered everywhere. And they didn't know the rest of the story. Paul Harvey was not around for those of you that are a little older. And so they went on like that. But I want you to notice something that John the Baptist in his preaching and teaching, in particular Mark chapter 1 verse 8, he taught clearly that Jesus would baptize with the Holy Spirit. In Mark chapter 1 and verse 8, John said, I baptize you with water but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. So there was a differential that John made, something that John told them to look for in Jesus the Messiah. In our day, there are so many presenting Jesus and claiming to have the truth. Just like the different messages we see there, we see today. We've got people, Mormons, we've got Jehovah's Witnesses, we've got Catholics, we've got Protestants, we've got Muslims, they present Jesus. All of these different people. And then you've got just idiots. And then you've got people that are just full of the devil. And they're presenting a version of Jesus to keep you from the real Jesus. So it's so important for you and me today to know the truth about Jesus Christ so that we can recognize a lie when we see it and so we don't get caught off guard. Just this week, I got a message from a Mormon missionary. Number one, he wanted to talk with me. Number two, he wanted to join face, our Facebook group for Spring Hill Baptist Church. Now, I, I didn't let him. On one hand, I'm sitting there saying, man, this guy needs to hear the gospel. But on the other hand, I knew if I let him on, the first thing he would start doing is promoting Mormonism. And so I rejected him. Every day on the radio, every day on TV, every day through the internet and through our social media, we are bombarded with all kinds of false teaching. And if we don't know the truth, we are subject to being pulled away to the lie. It's so important that we know the truth. And so it is up to the church to make disciples, that is teach people the truth about Jesus Christ, just like what we see in scripture, so that they will have complete knowledge. For example, in our text last week with Apollos who came from Alexandria, as I said just a while ago, Scripture said he was a great preacher and he knew Jesus by the baptism of John. And so the Bible says that a couple named Aquila and Priscilla took him aside and began to disciple him and teach him the way of Jesus more clearly and truthfully. He was humble. 
He received the truth. It changed his life. He became a born-again believer. And then he began to preach Jesus according to the truth. And remember, in Matthew chapter 28, the Great Commission, that is what Jesus told us to do. He said, go into the world and make disciples, teaching them all the things that I have told you. Folks, that's important that when you read Scripture, you see those things. We take Matthew chapter 28 and we beat our people over the head with evangelism. We need evangelism. We're commanded to evangelize, but Jesus said, make disciples. Because if you don't make disciples of those people, once you evangelize them and leave them to themselves, you wind up with exactly what we see here in our text today. People that don't know the truth. People that are floundering in a world full of false doctrine and every wind that blows. And that's what scripture warns us about. Now, another thing that we need to notice in our text is this. It's the order of salvation that is presented in our text. Because this is something that comes up in religious debates all of the time too. The order of salvation. Look at the order of salvation presented in this text in verse 4 and 5. As Paul is talking to these people, it says they heard the gospel, they believed, and they were baptized. That was the order that happened in this text. And notice what Paul asked them, okay? This is important. I, I, I tell you over and over, pay attention to what you read. Paul asked them, he said, have you received the Holy Spirit since you believed. Now, a lot of people want that to read, have you received the Holy Spirit since you were baptized? Because we put so much emphasis on baptism. You ask the average person on the street, are you a Christian? I was baptized. You ask the average church member, are you a Christian? I was baptized. No. And that's the point Paul and Luke is making through the Apostle Paul here. Have you received the Holy Spirit since you believed? Now this is one of the reasons that we need to understand Acts as a transition period. Because when you read through the book of Acts, you're going to find, and I'm fixing the show, I'm just going to take the time to do it this morning. You're going to find that there are all kinds of different ways that it is presented. Okay, for example, in chapter 8, Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. You remember how that went? The Ethiopian eunuch heard the teaching out of the book of Isaiah, the gospel in the Old Testament. And after he had heard that, he was convicted. And he looked at Philip and he said, man, here's water. Let me get baptized. And Philip jumped up and said, oh, we're going to baptize. No. Philip jumped up and he said, if you truly believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord, then I'll baptize you. And that's what happened. And I want you to notice when you read that, that there is no mention of, of the Holy Spirit coming upon him. No mention of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. In Acts chapter 9, the Apostle Paul, his conversion story. You've read that a hundred times. You know the story, but did you notice when you read it that he received the Holy Spirit when he believed on the Lord Jesus Christ and then he was baptized? Okay, well, since I've made those points, let's talk about Acts chapter 2. Peter standing up and preaching the gospel on the first day, the day of Pentecost. All the brothers were convicted in their heart and they said, brothers, what must we do to be saved? And Peter said, repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So that's at least three different ways that the gospel was presented and salvation was the prescription. Acts chapter 10. Peter and Cornelius. 
You remember that story? We preached on it here just a, a while. Actually, it's probably been three or four months ago now. But anyway, we preached on it. Peter went to Cornelius to preach the gospel. Cornelius had all these people gathered up to, to hear what was going on. And the Bible says that Peter got up and began to preach. And while he was preaching, no invitation, no would you come and receive Jesus Christ. Simply while he was preaching, the Holy Spirit fell on them. They were all baptized in the Holy Spirit. They professed Jesus Christ as Lord, and then Peter baptized them. Well, wait a minute, brother. That's completely, that's just the opposite of Acts chapter 2. And that's just the opposite of, of some of the others, and some of the others didn't say this, and some didn't say that. In Acts chapter 13, in Pisidian Antioch, the apostle Paul is preaching and he simply stood up and said, everyone that believes in Jesus is justified. That's it. That's what he preached. He didn't mention baptism. He didn't mention the Holy Spirit. And look what the results was in chapter 13, verse 48. And when the Gentiles heard this, they rejoiced and honored the word of the Lord and all who had been appointed to eternal life believed. No mention of the Holy Spirit. No mention of baptism. And if you really want to get technical, in some cases, repentance is mentioned. And in some cases, repentance isn't. Do you see that Acts is a transition period between Jesus Christ and the New Testament? It's a time that they're getting their feet on the ground. I don't think that any of this is an oversight. For example, I, I don't think that Peter was telling his story, Luke telling it in the book of Acts, Peter telling his story and saying, you know what, I, I still am kind of aggravated at Paul because he is getting so much glory through his work, so I'm going to show it a little bit different just to show him up. I don't think that happened. I don't think as Paul was, was recounting his stories through Timothy and through Silas and, and some of the others that he forgot to say something. I don't think that at all, nor do I think that what we have is a case of doctrinal error. A lot of people think that. A lot of people want you to believe that you have got to take one passage of scripture and that is the prescription. And if you don't do it that way, you're not a New Testament Christian and you're probably not saved. Hence Acts 2.38 and one of the denominations that are so prominent in our world today. I don't think that at all. I think that what we are told in these passages is exactly what the Holy Spirit wanted us to know. And if you'll read those passages, and if you'll focus on what you read, you will find that the center of every one of these passages is faith in Jesus Christ. At some point, somewhere in every one of these passages, these people trusted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. So my main point being is I would not go to seed on any of these passages. I wouldn't take any one of these and, and try to build a doctrine off of just this passage, excluding the other passages. And I certainly wouldn't try to build a denomination off of one of these passages. What I would do is I would search the rest of the New Testament and all of Scripture and see how these things are presented, see how the gospel is applied in the rest of the New Testament and throughout the apostles' teaching and what you will find throughout all of their teaching, all of their writings that we have in Scripture is that they all say salvation is by faith in Jesus Christ alone and baptism is rarely even mentioned. As a matter of fact, I did a search, and this is my search. So if you do it, you might come up with one or two different. I did a search, and I found from the book of Romans 
to the end of the book of Revelation 17 times that the word baptism or its other forms, baptisms, baptized was used 17 times. And out of those 17, I found only two that could definitely be said, this is water baptism. And actually, neither one of those two refer to salvation. All of the other times, it's obviously spirit baptism, except for one where I think Paul is actually making fun of somebody. Real quick, Romans chapter 6, verse 3 through 4. It's used three times. Paul says that if we are baptized into Christ, we are baptized into his death. And if we are baptized into his death, we will be brought forth in his resurrection. Obviously, spirit baptism is the meaning there. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 13 through 17. This is the passage where they're arguing. Some are saying, I was baptized by Peter. Some said, I was baptized by Paul. Some said, I was baptized by Jesus. Paul said, you're all idiots if that's all you can think about. Obviously, water baptism. 1 Corinthians 10, 2. Jesus, or Paul talking about comparing baptism to Moses in the cloud and the sea. He was saying that all of those that came out of Egypt were baptized into Moses because they saw the miracles and they experienced everything that Moses did. And he says our baptism is like that also. Obviously, spirit baptism. 1 Corinthians 12, 13. For we are all baptized into one spirit, into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and we are all given one spirit to drink. Obviously, Spirit baptism, not water. 1 Corinthians 15, 21. This is the one that I was talking about. Paul says, well, if you don't believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, why were you baptized for the dead? Well, you could take that either way. Most likely it's water baptism in that case. And then he says in Galatians 3, 27, those of you who were baptized into Christ have been clothed with Christ. Obviously, spirit baptism. Ephesians 4, 5. You enjoying this? Now you know what the Bible says. Amen? Amen. Ephesians 4, 5. Paul says, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. Spirit baptism. Colossians 2, 12. Buried with him in baptism. Spirit baptism. Hebrews 6, 2. Now here the writer is talking about the elementary things of faith. And what he is saying is, Here's where you are. All of these elementary things, you need to grow up and leave those things. And in that listing of things, in most of our translations, it says baptisms. Some of your newer translations put the word washings, as in ritual or ceremonial washings. So obviously that is water baptism. So that, that place, and then back up in 1 Corinthians 13 where they were arguing and Paul told them to shut up. Those were the two water baptisms. And then lastly, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 21, comparing Jesus' baptism to Noah and the ark, obviously spiritual baptism. So you see most of the way through the New Testament, the baptism that is linked to salvation is not water baptism. And I know in a Baptist church, we're all just sitting there, uh, uh, uh. Y'all better teach that, preach, or something. Well, folks, that's what the Bible says. I am not belittling water baptism at all. And if you come to me and say, Brother Don, I want to receive Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. After we go through that, the first thing I'm going to tell you to do is you need to be baptized as an outward profession, as a symbol to all the world, to the church of what has happened to you on the inside. But if you are not already baptized by the Holy Spirit into the body of Christ, water baptism does nothing but get you and me wet. It doesn't symbolize a thing. Baptism follows faith in Jesus Christ. And that's what the Bible teaches. That's why in our text, Paul asked these 12 men that he came to, had you received the Holy Spirit since you believed? Not since you were baptized. Now these guys 
just like Apollos, they had probably, and I'm, I'm ad-libbing here, either been to Jerusalem at some point and heard John the Baptist preach. They believed what he said. They believed that Jesus was the Messiah and they repented of their sins and were baptized and said they would follow Jesus, but they went back to wherever they were because Paul's in the outer regions now uh, of the European, what we would call the European countries. He's out in the uttermost parts of the world for them. They didn't have cable TV, so they didn't know what happened in Jerusalem. And a trip to Jerusalem for a lot of these people was not a yearly or monthly thing. Sometimes it was a once in a lifetime trip. So all they knew was what they knew. And so Paul says, well, since you believe, did you receive the Holy Spirit? And they say, hey, we didn't know about that. Paul said, well, what were you baptized to? They said, well, John's baptized. Paul said, oh, let me teach you about the Messiah that John proclaimed to you. And so he taught them. And when they heard the truth about Jesus, the scripture says, when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of Jesus. Well, how were they baptized? It doesn't say. So what are we to believe? Is it water baptism that saved them or were they baptized in the Holy Spirit? Well, let me show you in Scripture. I'm going to do this again. This is a Bible lesson this morning. Let me show you in Scripture what the Bible teaches about New Testament baptism and when we receive the Holy Spirit. Okay, now this is not going to be as long. I only got four verses. John chapter 7, verse 38 and 39, Jesus speaking, and he says, The one who believes in me, as the Spirit said, will have streams of living water flowing from deep within him. He said this about the Spirit, who those who believed in Jesus were going to receive, for the Spirit had not yet been given, because Jesus had not yet been glorified. So what does Jesus tell us to look forward to? Water baptism? Some religious rite or ritual? He tells us to look forward to the baptism of the Holy Spirit. What does he say? Those who believe in Jesus were going to receive the Holy Spirit. So when does Jesus teach that you receive the Holy Spirit? When? You believe. When you come to that point in your life, when you say, yes, Jesus is Lord and Savior, and I submit my life to him, Jesus says you receive the Holy Spirit. Peter said in Acts chapter 2, verse 38, I've already quoted this. He replied, repent and be baptized, each of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. What's the import there? Well, obviously it's repent, it's receive Jesus, but what's he driving at? He said, if you'll receive Jesus Christ, if you'll trust him as Lord and Savior, you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Galatians 3.14. Paul teaching about Gentiles coming into the family of Christ. And through the promise of Abraham. And he says this. He says the purpose was for the blessing of Abraham. Would come to the Gentiles by Christ Jesus. Now what is the blessing of Abraham. That the Gentiles are so eagerly wanting and waiting for. Ought to be a question every one of us would ask when we read this. And listen what he says. So that we could receive the promised Holy Spirit through faith. Not baptism. Not church membership. Not the preacher or some apostle or prophet laying hands on you. That's not what scripture teaches. That happened in the book of Acts during a transition period, but you never see it again in the New Testament. 
Because the New Testament teaches that we receive the Holy Spirit when? When we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul said that was the promise that God gave through Abraham. And then Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13 and 14, this is the last. In him you also were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and when you believed. The Holy Spirit is the down payment of our inheritance until the redemption of the possession to the praise of his glory. So again, what does the New Testament teach us? We receive the Holy Spirit when we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to tell you as a statement of fact, based on the word of God, if you have not been baptized by the Holy Spirit into the body of Christ through faith, you are not born again and saved. I can baptize you every Sunday from now till eternity comes. We can pray all kinds of spiritual prayers and quote all kinds of verses, but if you have never truly, totally submitted your life to Jesus Christ, and received the Holy Spirit into your heart and life, you were not saved. Amen. Now that ought to cause you to say, well, brother, how do I know? Because that's one problem with spiritual things. Can't see them. Several of you have professed Christ since I've been pastor here. I've led you through scripture. I've baptized you, but I never once saw the Holy Spirit enter any of you. Wish I could, because I could go around and say, you're cool, you're cool, <laughs> chill out, you're cool. But I can't. Because you can't see the Holy Spirit. And I can't see the Holy Spirit baptize you into the body of Christ what can I see what the New Testament tells us a changed life now that's what you see in all of these is a changed life and I want to tell you today as a statement of fact from the word of God if you have professed Jesus Christ before the child, I don't care where, even in your bedroom by yourself, and nothing changed. Your lifestyle, your behavior, your habits, then you weren't baptized in the Holy Spirit. You may have had water baptism. You may have had a wonderful religious experience. But you weren't born again. That's what John chapter 3, Jesus and Nicodemus is all about. If anybody was cool and going to heaven, it had been Nicodemus. He was the teacher, Pharisee of all. But yet Jesus said, if you're not born again, if you haven't received the Holy Spirit from on high, you can't be saved. Folks, you can go to just about any passage of Scripture in the New Testament and take that passage of Scripture, hear me, and take that passage of Scripture and make just about any doctrine, any teaching you want to. But, as we are encouraged to do, study to show yourself approved unto God, a worker that needeth not to be ashamed, but rightly 
dividing the word of God. If you study scripture, you can only come to one conclusion. And that conclusion is that when you receive the Lord Jesus Christ by faith, you are saved and the Holy Spirit baptizes you into the body of Christ, makes you born again. We call it regeneration and you change. That's what I'm offering to you today. Salvation in Jesus Christ. The baptism of the Holy Spirit. You say, well, preacher, does that mean I'm going to change overnight? I'm going to become a new person? Just I'm going to walk out of here just all holy? No, that's not what that means. But what that means is you're going to walk out of here with a desire, with a change. And over days and weeks, you're going to change. You're going to be like Jesus. Christian, it means the same thing for you. If you're still not changing, if you're still not growing in the Lord Jesus Christ, you may be baptized in the Holy Spirit, but you're backslidden. You're dying spiritually on the vine. Repent today and be alive in Jesus Christ. Let's stand. I know this was long and boring, but I also know you can't walk out of here today and say, I don't know the truth.